This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and I'm with former UFC champion who's also held championships in Pancreas, and he's a champion kickboxer as well, Guy Mesger. How are you doing today, sir? Doing well, doing well. How are you? Very good, considering we still have to deal with all this stuff going on in the world right now, but uh, we're doing the best we can. <laughs> Which stuff? The disastrous uh, presidential uh uh debate that actually embarrassed the entire americans for that we had two our two candidates argue like uh, a, a couple of five-year-olds that's pretty bad i guess and oh yeah the two hundred thousand people dying from COVID. i'm not sure which one is worse at this point you're a doctor too are you not yes uh not you're not like a, a family doctor or more of a science doctor yeah i mean i have i have a I have my uh, degree in, in, in natural medicine. I'm a naturopathic doctor, but I have uh, my PhD in holistic health, uh, my master's in um, nutrition, and I'm um, also a functional neurologist, an applied movement neurology neurologist. So despite getting uh, kicked out of college a few times, you still managed to get your degrees? Yeah, yeah, 38. <laughs> I got my undergrad. I got my undergrad 38 years old, but... Um, and it was, uh, to be honest, Mark uh, Cuban actually was um, kind of inspiration for that. I was working for him as the president of his television company. And um, we were talking about some of the changes that were coming up. And I was telling him, like, you know, that I enjoyed working for him. I mean, it was a great thing. He did a great job uh, helping me out a great deal because I didn't know what I was going to do after I retired. Um, and so we had a little talk about stuff. And then um, he just encouraged me to go back to school and do what I wanted to do. So I did. And it was a blessing. And as far as your martial arts and fighting career, I understand that you started fighting basically very young in, in school and then you yeah. got into wrestling and it kind of went on from there. Kind of, yeah. I mean, um, it was a different time. We were, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 52, man. So you got to appreciate that uh, um, I started school early, you know. So, like, I was in kindergarten in, 19, in 1972. And, and what was going on was, um, you know, they had this forced busing and things like that. They were, they were trying, it was a good idea. Just in reality, it just didn't work well. And so, you know, there was this just kind of a tumultuous situation back then in the early seventies. And, um, you know, to be honest, they, uh, they looked at fighting a little bit different and we, we all did back then. I mean, nobody shot anybody back then, you know, and, uh, you know, usually got in a little scuffle with somebody. And then after the scuffle, you usually became friends with them <laughs> You know, today, not so much. What is forced busing anyways? I've heard you mention that in a couple of interviews, but I don't know what it is. Oh, really? Well, that's because you're young. <laughs> but forced busing was, uh, what it was, was a, uh, I tell you what they were trying to do, they were trying to integrate the schools. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, obviously like a lot of the suburban schools, uh, suburbia had, you know, better schools, had more money and stuff like that than the inner schools. And so what they were trying to do is get an interchange. So they were taking kids that were like normally kind of country kids or, suburban kids and they were they were uh, busing them to uh, you know downtown some of the kids downtown and then they were busing some of the other kids from downtown to you know out to the burbs you know so uh, there was kind of more of a cultural exchange and like I said it was it was it's a good idea uh, it just didn't really work in practical sense because you know people were used to their neighborhoods and things like that and so, so, was so I know you started your amateur wrestling career at about eight years old. How did you do in amateur wrestling? How did I do in amateur wrestling? Yeah. Well, as an eight-year-old, I didn't do so well, but um, <laughs> luckily I got better. <laughs> and, uh, well, in high school, I mean, I, I, was a, I wasn't a great college wrestler or anything, but I was a pretty decent uh, high school wrestler. I, uh, I, I uh, won state three years in a row, and, um, um, and I was on the uh, junior uh, – I was an alternate on the junior national team. I was a member of the 1600 schoolboys uh, – uh, national team. I took sixth in the nation in Greco and school boys. And um, I started school early. So I was actually 16 as a senior. <laughs> and so um, anyways, um, and then I went to college. I wrestled in college uh, and um, managed to get kicked out of college. So I didn't really do, uh, I didn't really have an opportunity to um, uh, show what I could do in wrestling then. And 
and basically, to be honest, I, a couple of years after being out of school, I, I, I turned pro as a boxer and kickboxer. At what point in time did you start training in uh, karate and martial arts? Uh, I started that at 14. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I gravitated towards individual sports. I, you know, I'll be honest, I, I was a kid with a lot of self-esteem issues. Like I would imagine a lot of us are at that age. And, uh, you know, and, um, you know, w w the one thing I did real well was athletics. Um, but the problem with like most athletes, like team athletics is like, I like being part of a team, but you know, I'm intense, so intense. And I mean, to a point of like, probably need to be like talking to a therapist type intense about winning. And um, I hated it that football took 11 other guys to win the damn game. Cause the, the, the one guy who would, who would always be the slacker would miss his tackle or do something like that. And we'd lose the game because of that. And it used to drive me nuts. And same thing with baseball and stuff like that. And um, whereas combat sports, you need a team, which I like, but you can win on your own. And I, I like that. So I, I kind of gravitated towards that. And I just basically focused on wrestling uh, my sophomore year in high school on because um, even though I was a good football player and a pretty decent baseball player, um, my uh, my shoulders weren't holding up good for, for baseball. I couldn't really pitch anymore. And, and I wasn't a big guy, you know, again, because I started school early. And so, you know, I knew they weren't going to recruit. I mean, I, I was all district linebacker as a freshman. In fact, I was one of three all district players in the state of Washington at, at uh, uh, single A. And, um, but they were going to recruit 100, you know, at that time I was 135, 140 pounds. They were going to recruit 135, 140 pound uh, linebacker. But I was, uh, you know, a real good wrestler. So that's where I kind of stayed. What was the professional kickboxing scene like when you got into kickboxing? Uh, well, in Texas, it was non-existent, <laughs> to be honest. Um, you know, they, they, they had some guys back, back in, the, in, the, in the late 70s, early days, Demetrius Vannis and Billy Jackson, uh, Ishmael Robles, all guys that were world champions, uh, uh, Ray McCallum and stuff like that. They, 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 they fought regularly, but by, you know, by the, uh, uh, you know, 83, 84, you didn't really, they didn't have it. Demetrius Vannis passed away in 80. And so they didn't really have anybody motivated to do it. And then when I decided I want to be a kickboxer, uh, you know, to be honest, we started promoting um, our own fights and um, we drew a crowd uh, that way. And it was, um, you know, so we basically initiated or, or restarted uh, kickboxing in Texas. And um, I got a pretty good reputation. And then I, I got invitations, obviously, to fight uh, elsewhere. M most of my uh, boxing and kickboxing career have all been in the United States. But I fought uh, several times in Europe, uh, a couple times in Canada and once in Mexico. But that's about ex the, the extent of my boxing and kickboxing career. I had uh, 23 or uh, 25 fights and um, kickboxing. And just, uh, I, I enjoy kickboxing a great deal, but, you know, to be honest, there's not any money in it. And if you're going to make a career out of this, you got to figure out how to make money. And as far as no holds barred fighting, did you start fighting in Japan first or UFC? It was UFC. I mean, you, I mean, uh, Japan. Japan's never really been super high on the no holds bar they uh you know the, the, the fascination with it obviously ufc captured everyone's imagination over there but they they, they tend to like rules <laughs> and a certain amount of civility to the game versus the ufc's original thought process really was what well, wasn't really athlete against athlete it was more style against style who'd win between a boxer and a wrestler who'd win between a wrestler and a jiu-jitsu guy who'd win between a jiu-jitsu guy and a karate guy and um you know, and it was, uh, you know, it really wasn't a sport. It was more of a spectacle, you know what I mean? And um, it, you know, eventually uh, grew, uh, you know, uh, that spectacle part of it, the NHB part of it, you know, basically came to a screeching halt pretty quick. And um, some of our entertainment group who the group people who had the, had UFC first, um, they were uh, not, um, you know, they, they weren't, they, they didn't really see the future in, in, in it as well as like Zufa and those guys, those guys did a much better job with, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, basically they turn it into a sport. Let's face it. I mean, we, we, we owe a lot. I mean, as much as we, some people love or hate the, you know, Dana and those guys, to be honest, we wouldn't be here today having this conversation, but it wasn't for Dana and, uh, um, the Petitas. What was your reaction when you first found out about this, uh, no holds barred fighting and what made you want to get into it? <laughs> I think I had a death wish or something, right? Um, actually, what, what it was, uh, you know, uh, well, everyone, you know, got, 
martial arts magazines and everything had um, had uh, you know were announcing the no holds barred stuff and and it was uh, you know it was pretty you know it was a pretty crazy concept and I just figured it was BS you know I figured it was just some kind of pro wrestling deal and um, uh, and you know so I tuned into it. I, I hung out at a friend of mine's house and uh, he's a martial arts instructor also and and there, I don't know there's about a dozen of us were there watching it and man when uh, when that poor sumo got kicked in the face by Gerard Gudeau it was like holy crap it's for real <laughs> and and i noticed the guys and, and really what i thought about was my motivation really was the fact that my career was really going nowhere i had a lot of accolades i was a world kickboxing i mean i was a number one rated kickboxer i was an undefeated boxer i was world karate champ world full contact karate champion uh all sorts of cool stuff but i wasn't really making a significant amount of money i'm in my mid-20s i'm like what am I going to do? And so I saw the USC and, and I really thought, yeah, I, I can win. You know, I had a lot of, back, you know, I came from a wrestling background. I, I had uh, an extensive judo background on top of being, you know, um, you know, boxer, kickboxer and all that kind of stuff. So there, you know, I figured, you know, I, I was kind of built for this deal. And uh, so that's really where it is. And I, and I thought, you know what, they're not going to let this go on for too much longer. So why don't I go in this tournament, win it, and I could brag to everybody that I did this and finish a career and then, you know, go off and do something else. Um, and so um, the the site promoter, a guy named Buddy Alvin, who site, did the site promotions for UFC, uh, he also did a lot of, he promoted a lot of my fights outside of Texas. And um, so he asked me if I'd be interested. And I, and, I, and, and I said, yeah, of course. And then me and Anthony Macias, actually, Anthony, he represented Anthony and a lot of that stuff too, uh, promotions outside of Oklahoma. And um he basically said, okay, one guy can be an alternate, one guy can enter the tournament, and we flipped the coin, and Anthony won, and he won to enter the tournament. So so I, I got the uh, position of, uh, it wasn't even really an alternate position, it was like, it was a, it was a, a fight they put in to um, give uh, the guys in the final a break before. So as far as UFC 4, there was a rumor you had a gentleman's agreement for no hair pulling, uh, because hair pulling was legal in those days. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, um, Jason Farron had long hair. I had long hair. And uh, I was ready to go get a cut. And I walked up to him. I was like, hey, dude. I said, we can go get our hair cut here or we can just uh, have a you know, gentleman's agreement. We don't pull hair and don't act like a bunch of, you know, let's not make this a chick fight. Let's make this a fight. And uh, I said, listen, dude, you don't pull my hair? I said, I won't headbutt you, bite you, or poke you in the eyes. We'll just have a clean fight. You know, I mean, that's the way it should be. And he agreed. And, you know, to be honest, in, in fairness to J Jason, you know, who didn't do really well against me, you know, he was having his ass handed to him the whole, almost the entire fight. And he never was my hair. So he was, uh, he was honorable. What was it like uh, showing up for that? Were you nervous at all? Uh, <laughs> because he still knew? Yeah, I didn't sleep good. Uh, the moment I agreed to do that, I didn't sleep good. For like the longest time, and um, you know, it was one of those things where uh, you know I just was like, um, you know, I had a ton of fights. I don't know how some of these guys did, man. I had like you know, I don't know, sixty something fights before I stepped in there, and a ton of amateur fights before I stepped in there, and and I was nervous. And in fact, I remember everyone bragging about, uh, 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 you know, they were doing their interviews, and I can't wait to get in there to do this. I can't wait to do that. And I'm like. And they interviewed me. I was like, am I the only one who's scared here? Because I haven't slept good since I agreed to do this. And uh, it was kind of funny, too, because the people at FC that were really nice, they thought I was maybe a little too nice for this. And, they, and, and, and this one lady, Kathy, I can't remember, I think it was Kathy Davis was her name. She was running the show at the time. She comes, comes to me, guy, you, you don't have to do this. <laughs> you don't have to do this. You, you're really not. And I started laughing. I was like, listen, this nice guy acts up the moment I step in the ring. Don't worry about it. I can handle myself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then I had to fight. So. And then you returned at UFC five. Any memories of that one? Yeah, I guess I was supposed to be in the tournament, but uh, Oleg was, uh, you know, Oleg Tatarov was been with me, and he had some issues with his uh, visa, and uh, so uh, you know, I, I agreed to let him take my place, and I was in an alternate position again. And I fought a guy, uh, uh, John Dowdy, his name, uh, you know, tough guy, but really didn't have any business being in there against me. Um, you know, in fact, I had the same agreement with him, but he was bald. So he did try to grab my hair <laughs> and I headbutted him, <laughs> broke his nose. Felt kind of bad about that. But and business. UFC uh, 13, you won the whole tournament. 
any memories of that? I know you broke your hand, and I, I believe that's the one where you beat Tito Ortiz. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, I I uh, we I wore gloves too. You know, it was the first time I wore gloves in the UFC, and um, it was interesting because I, uh, you know, I broke my hand on uh, Christoph Linger's head, and uh, you know, he was a uh, you know, uh, it was interesting. It was the first time I ever broke my hand. And uh, ever, and, and like I said, I, I had 43 bare knuckle, full contact karate fights and, you know, you know, all the karate training and all that kind of stuff and tons of boxing, kickboxing, fight. never, never injured myself. And then I'm, I have a few bare knuckle fights, not a problem. Then I hit Christoph Langer a little too, too many times in the forehead and broke my hand. Did you consider quitting the tournament at that point? Well, we were thinking, you know, yeah, it was the point of like, you know, we had to cut my glove off my hand because it swelled up so bad. I was cutting the circulation off. But to be honest, man, it was like the last time I, the guys came through for me, you know, my, my, my training partners, the Lions, then they came through for me and I'm looking around the room and there was a huge amount of disappointment in everybody's face. And, and it was interesting because going back in the ring to the, that in the finals really wasn't for me. You know, it was, it was actually for my teammates. It was probably the first time that I can safely say, I didn't fight for myself. I actually fought for my, my, my teammates because I knew how much they, they put in to, to, to do it, how disappointed they were that I got injured. And I, I was... oh, it looks like we temporarily, lo temporarily lost Guy. Hopefully he'll be back. This, uh, this happens sometimes uh, in the live streams. And I see all of you guys have your questions here. Um, I will get into the questions uh, towards the end of this interview uh, when I'm done, but we'll hope we can get them back. That's the problem with the live stream. Sometimes uh, we lose connection. I highly suggest uh, you people check out the interview I did with Chemo yesterday, which ended up being nearly two hours, part one and part two. And I got a bunch more interviews coming up. Boss Rutin I did on uh, Monday, I believe it was. That was a great interview. But I appreciate all your support and, and all the questions as we see if, if Guy's going to come back here because we were just getting into the interesting stuff. Um, but, yeah, this happens from time to time. As Murd says, damn, just was it? We were just getting into the the Tito and the Ken Shamrock topic, um, and then he disappeared. So uh, that happens. He's all he's in Texas. I'm up in Canada. So we'll see if we can get him back. Distant Mammoth likes this MMA fighter series. You're gonna see more MMA interviews as time goes on on this channel because it's, the fact is I just don't like wrestling anymore. I, uh, I find it fairly boring. So we'll see if he comes back. I'll, uh, I'll read to some of your comments while we're waiting to see if he's going to be able to come back on. Jack was enjoying it. Mad Hop says Guy was one tough bastard. He still is tough, for sure. NWO says uh, Guy was a badass, great career, and true legend of MMA. Mirrored is uh, checking in. And Smart Killer wanted to know about the Lion's Den. I was right about to ask about the Lion's Den. It's unfortunate that this happened. We'll hope. I hope we can get him back on. Sean says Guy was the king of Pancrase. He was. He was. He's a great fighter. I was happy to have him on. Let's hope we can get him back. Sean Wood thinks Guy should have a medal just for putting up with Ken Shamrock and the Lions dead. Well... <laughs> Not a lot of people could put up with Ken Shamrock, by the way. Just drinking my protein shake here, waiting for him to come back. Well, that sucks, guys. I'm really sorry about this. 
OG says Guy is an old uh, main OG of the UFC. Yep. Jack mentioned that uh, his uh, feud with his war with Wanderlei Silva was really good. I was going to ask him about the pro wrestling smart killer, but we might be out of luck for today. We might be out of luck for today. I might. Oh, here he's back. Hey, man, I, I don't know what happened, but my, my thing went off. I apologize. It's okay. We were just talking about uh, UFC 13 and your your hand breaking and your fight with Tito on that card. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, like I said, I I I, I, uh, I just went in back in and fought. You know, I wasn't. I figured you know I had enough skills. I could work around a broken hand. You know, it's like I've, I I worked around a broken foot in kickboxing for a year, so I figured you know what the heck. And so, uh, you know, it was kind of an interesting de deal for me. Like I said, it was the, kind of the first time I actually didn't actually fight for for me as I did for my for my brothers that put out all the effort. So it just turned out well. Are you surprised that Tito went on to become the big star that he did? Could you see the potential in him when you were fighting him that night? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he you know, he was a, a tremendously strong athlete, you know, and I'm not used to somebody being – uh, you know, that's, you know, to be honest, I'm usually the, I don't look it, but I'm pretty damn strong. And, uh, I'm usually not, uh, custom the guys being that, that physically strong and I'm going against and Tito was, and, um, you know, and he was smart, you know, he got, you know, he, he, you know, got away from kind of the element that he was dealing with, with the tank Abbott guys and got his own identity and got his own training. And, um, you know, he did real well, you know? And as far as your training at the Lions Den with Ken Shamrock, there's lots of fans on here that want to know the details of how you started training with him and what your training was like there. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, most people probably, if they're interested in the tryout. So originally, what happened? How I met Ken was UFC three. The UFC flew me out to UFC three because they wanted me to fight in UFC four. And but, you know, I want to have a whole measure of what was going on. You know, I, I don't like the idea of just kind of jumping in there. So I went to see the promotion. They flew me out there to see the promotion and see the event. And it was crazy. It was like the Wild West. You know, but Tito, I mean, that was back when Chemo almost beat Hoist. And there was literally almost a, 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 a gang war between uh, a bunch of angry Brazilian Gracie fans and uh, and uh, Chemo's guys. And um, so I was like, this is pretty crazy. And in that craziness, I was having uh, breakfast or lunch. I don't really remember which one. And uh, Bob Shamrock was there with Frank. And I don't know, we struck up a conversation and basically said, hey, listen, I'm supposed to fight in this thing, but I've never fought with these kind of rules before or anything. And, and you know, I was familiar with what Pancrase was and stuff. I said, I would love the opportunity to go out there and maybe work with you guys some. So uh, we did. And then so I, I went out there, uh, uh, I don't know, two weeks before the event. And uh, got, uh, um, uh, you know, went and uh, got, uh, uh, you know, went trained and stuff. But then Ken was like, you know, hey, you want to try out for my team, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right. You know, I didn't know what, try out, what the tryout meant. But then what the tryout meant was I had to do 500 squats, 500 sit-ups, 500 leg lifts, 200 push-ups. I had to run a mile and a half and 12 minutes after doing that. And you were supposed to fight for 15 minutes. And so I was like, oh, shit. Okay. And so I did it. And uh, became an official lion's dinner after that, and um, and the training was, you know, you know, the training was just, uh, you know, uh, you know, it was basically a reflection. Ken got a lot of good insight with it when he was starting to do his training with the, the Pancreas organization, and um, you know, so a lot of that was uh, emulated from that. And then we went to, uh, um, you know, and then went to, uh, you know, like I said, then. You know, once we started figuring out how to play the game, you know, then it was, um, you know, it was a lot different. You know, um, you know, at first, I think guys would just didn't know what to expect in the UFC. It was hard to do that. And then when they started adding time limits and things like that, that actually gave a little bit better boundary for guys to be able to figure out how to, you know, train better for it. And uh, that's kind of, and just that was kind of the evolutionary process. Uh, there's a fan on here asking, how was the money to fight in that tournament at UFC? 13, uh, where you beat Tito, I'm guessing it wasn't a huge payday. 
No, I wasn't. Um, I don't really like discussing money on stuff, but no, I wasn't significant. I mean, not like it is today. You know, that's why, to be honest, I fought overseas most of the time because even, you know, uh, UFC really didn't uh, become, um, you know, a job. I mean, you couldn't really work for the UFC uh, without having a second job, you know, if you were uh, just because of money. And so, to be honest, I said, you know, fighting overseas in Japan, you know, I fought every six weeks with Pancrase and, uh, excuse me, you know, and, I, and made a significant amount of, um, you know, income doing that, so which allowed me to come back to the UFC. I'm going to guess it was uh, Shamrock and the Lions Den that arranged for you to go over there and fight in Pancras. Yeah, yeah. Ken had uh, Ken had the hookup. What was your experience like going over there to Japan with the uh, different culture the first time and and fighting under those rules over there? Well, uh, you know, uh I was excited to be honest. I mean, you know, I always, I was a big, you know, fan of kind of Japanese culture because of uh, books I read. I, I, I read uh, the biography of Yamamoto Masashi, which was a, literally was, uh, you know, it was like a 1800 pages about this man who was a famous swordsman and philosopher and everything in Japan. So I was always had a desire to go to Japan. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I kind of stuck with the fight business after UFC four I kind of figured, you know what, maybe I'm just going to go on and do something else. And then I said, oh, well, then they, then I was guaranteed to shot at UFC 5. So, so I'm going to do that. And then right after that, Pancrase came knocking. And I was like, oh, I want to go to Japan anyway. So I went went over there and then it just started a, a, a whole new career. But I enjoyed it. Pancrase was uh, fun because Pancrase was considered the strong. We were, they used to call us the king of the strong styles. And uh, because pro wrestling over there, um, it's a little different, or it was. I don't know if it still is. It was different over there. Like the guys really knew how to wrestle. Now they may have done work matches or something like that, but they could really wrestle and really fight. And um, Pancras was the first time it was all shoots, which is a term for all real matches. And um, you know, it was like it was a big deal over there. I mean, we we were quite the celebrities in um, in, in the nineties. Were you uh, exposed to any of the Japanese mafia over there sponsoring you dinners or? trips to uh massage parlors and stuff like we hear about <laughs> no nah, I, I there's an old saying you can't make a deal with the devil and get in heaven so I, I do my best to kind of steer clear with that as far as uh the groupies uh what was better the groupies over in uh kickboxing or mma <laughs> yeah the, the, the pathetic part about it is, is that there's only a short amount of time that I didn't have a girlfriend, so I never really get to enjoy that aspect of uh, 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 of celebrity life. But um, you know, uh, to be honest, I mean, the Japanese culture was a lot is a lot different. I mean, and, 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 and the experience over there was a lot different than, let's say, the fan base here. So, I mean, that's 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 the best way to put it. What was the main differences between Pancras and Pride when? You switched over to Pride. What was the main difference? Uh, well, well, two main differences were a significant amount more money, and um, which was saying something because I was doing pretty good at Pancrase. And then um, the uh, the rules, you know, the rules were uh, much more um, um, you know, the rules were much more uh, liberal back then. You know, what I mean, you know, you could stomp a guy on the ground. The only thing you couldn't do, which is kind of weird, you couldn't elbow the guy. Um, but anything else was basically okay. I mean, you couldn't eye gouge or bite, but you could stomp a guy on the ground. You could soccer kick his head in. And so the, the rules were a little bit more liberal <laughs> than the uh, Pancrase rules. Any, any memories of your uh, KO victory over Kevin Randleman in Pride? I didn't beat, I never fought Candle. I never fought Candle. Okay, that must have been a fan question. That's wrong. You did fight Chuck Liddell. I know that one didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't go turn up. But, um, you know, it just shows you how tough, tough uh, you know, Chuck is. I knocked him down once and wobbled him twice, and he still got a, had enough wherewithal to knock me out. So, you know, he's a, he's a tough son of a gun. It was a good fight. Did you ever fight Boss Rutin over there? Yeah, I, I lost the Boss. I fought Boss and uh, Pancras. How was uh, he to fight? Because obviously he was one of the, uh, the toughest fighters of all time. Yeah, I... Uh, to be honest, I was winning the fight the whole entire fight right up to the point he got the uh, uh, heel hook on me. And, 
and got and, and you know i'll tell you boss you know he's super, he's he's another guy who's like crazy strong he got a hold of my ankle i didn't think much about it and then bam he turned it up so um it was a, it was a good win because like i said he he was on the up to that point he was on the probably on the way to losing because i was pretty much controlled the fight up to that point there's a fan on here asking about your heat with Enzo Inui. Uh, well, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, last name is Enoway and it's uh, Ensign. There wasn't any real heat. What it was was I've always had a huge amount of respect for him, and I always assumed he had a huge amount of respect for me. At least he's always showed, showed that. And so, you know, what, what they were wanting me to do is I was fighting his brother, and me and him were supposed to fight in UFC 4, and um, – uh, but I mean, USC 13, but he injured an eye or something. I don't remember exactly what the injury was, but he, uh, uh, went out of the tournament and that's how Tito got in. And, um, so when, uh, when I fought his brother, they, they told me, Hey, we're going to, we're going to try to promote a fight between you and Ensign, uh, Egan's, I was fighting Egan at the time and he wanted, they were, were doing, so, Hey, after the fight, uh, call him out. You know, like, let him know like that so we can promote, promote deals. So I said, okay, no problem. And, uh, you know, and they told me that he, he he knew about it. He was expecting it. And then, so what ended up happening was, uh, you know, I go up there and I go, all right, showtime. He goes, what do you mean? Yeah, well, I, said, I said, get ready. I said, I'm going to call you out. Anyway, so, you know, I did. I, I tried to, you know, not be terribly disrespectful or anything like that because I was kind of going to call out stuff a little bit. I mean, it can be handled very, really poorly. And so I said, and I look at his face and I realized he had no idea this was happening. And so afterwards I finished, man, he lost his, you know, he, he wasn't very happy. And so, um, you know, to be honest, I, I, I felt bad. I, I felt like, you know, nobody wants to be, you know, no, nobody wants to be a sucker punch like that. And so I felt bad. So what I ended up doing, just going over, I went to his dressing room and just basically apologized. I told him my end of the deal and everything. And, he wasn't very happy with uh, the uh, uh, pride people. One guy in particular there that handles stuff. He he got kind of a uh, 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 ensign kind of roughed him up a little bit, but there's no real heat. Like I said, that 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 was the, that was the problem. And, it, and like I said, I, I squashed it once I realized what was going on. There's a few people on here asking about the Sakuraba fight and. Some people, I guess, think Ken Shamrock cost you that fight in some ways. How do you feel about that? Oh, well, the Japanese cost me that fight because they reneged on the deal that they were supposed to go. I mean, they called me up with uh, 17 days notice to take a fight against Sakuraba. And I've been I've been dealing with a, uh, a kidney disorder, you know, so I hadn't been training or anything, you know. And, and, and normally I wouldn't have taken the fight. But to be honest, they threw so much money at me, I said, all right, I can fight any human being for that much money for 15 minutes, right? And so the way the rules were set up in this deal was you had a 15-minute fight, all right? If there was no decision that could be rendered, like a draw, then you had to fight another 15-minute fight. And um, I said, listen, I'll take this fight, but I'm only doing one 15-minute. And, and, and there was a bunch of other guys that had that same agreement. And uh, so anyway, so they, really what they did, they brought me over. They knew I wasn't training because of the injuries and stuff like that. And they wanted to, you know, they wanted Sakuraba to, you know, beat the former king of Pancrase. And and it just didn't turn out the way they wanted to because I wasn't in the mood to lose. And um, and so, uh, you know, they basically changed the, the rules right on the spot, man, and said, hey, we're doing another round. I'm like, no, we're not doing another round. And so, you know, to be honest, uh, they, you know, it wasn't Ken who cost me that. It was... Uh, the pride shenanigans that cost me that fight. Chug Alert wants me to ask you about beating up Paul Lansby. L Lansby? Lansby, yeah. Uh, I had a match against him. I I, I, I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I, I mean, I never had any beef with him. I mean, uh, if he's talking about that, I mean, I, I had a Pancreas style match with him in, da in Dallas. Uh, we, um, we found a way to get around the, the uh, boxing commission's rules uh, for MMA because we did basically pro wrestling matches. And so, but they were real. And uh, they, the way they had it set up in the boxing commission is if pro wrestling at the time was real because they collected fees for it. So we just did it like as a pro wrestling match and we just did basically did shoots. And I fought uh, Paul uh, in that one. And uh, he's, he's a tough guy, man. Boy, I'll tell you something, man. I hit him with some pretty, pretty good stuff. And, 
and I ended up, uh, I think I caught him in a, in a arm, arm triangle and finished him from, from my back. But, um, I don't remember. It was a long time ago, but I think that's how I beat him. But yeah, he was a tough guy. It was a good match. Stanley wants to know what your most problematic fight was. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, there could be a laundry list of problematic issues. I mean, you man, there, there are times when it was a bitch to make weight and that was a problem. There was a problem. You know, um, you know, there was, there, there was, I, I'm not sure. Which I, I think what I'll do is I'll kind of run with this. Probably the most technical thing, to, you know, problem that I had, uh, kind of frustrating one was, uh, 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 was um, well, I think two of them. One was my match with uh, Liddell, man. He just wouldn't go down. I mean, I was catching with shots, and I was like, damn, man, this guy is, you know, he was, he was hard to put down. So I think that was obviously problematic, right? And then, um, and then I would say technically, you know, the guy who could frustrate you more than just about any human being would be Sakuraba. You know, he, he's a, amazing. He's a trickster and stuff that he does. And, you know, he's naturally a good fighter, even though he's maybe not the best striker. He's an amazing wrestler, an amazing submission guy, you know, but his striking is kind of, but he's such a good fighter that he can make kind of, you know, his mediocre skills there really effective. And he, and he did a good job. He was a frustrating guy to fight. Leg kick wants to know about your fight with Wanderlei Silva. Oh, uh, with, with Vanderlei? Vanderlei, yeah. Uh, what does he want to know? Uh, your thoughts on it and how did you prepare for that fight? Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I prepare. Like, I always prepare. I mean, um, going in that fight, you know, I uh, I had some, um, you know, uh, you know, typical, you know, came in actually with a hurt foot that fight, but – the thing with Vanderlei was um, it was a good fight. You know, he uh, caught me with a really, really, really stiff headbutt, which uh, kind of, um, well, it, 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 that was probably the, wor the worst, you know, that, that, that shot hurt pretty bad. And it, it cut me. It was interesting. That was the first cut I've ever had um, in, in a fight. I've been cut and trained, but never actually been cut in a bout, which is saying something. I've, I've had 145 pro fights and God knows how many amateur fights. And uh, that was the first time I ever got cut. Smart Killer wants to know your thoughts on Frank Shamrock. On Frank? Uh, uh, I mean, guys, if you want to ask questions, be a little more specific. I mean, Frank's a good guy. I mean, I've known Frank, you know, you know, what, you know, close to uh, 25 years or more, you know. He's a phenomenal phenomenal athlete he's another one of those guys that just naturally is a great fighter he's a, he's he and he wasn't really super technical when he started fighting and um and then became really quite the technician both in striking you know it, and, and his ground game he, he became very uh very technical and very good and like i said he, and you mix that with his his natural ability to fight and man he he, he was something in his day there's no doubt about that and uh Frank is the consummate trickster. He was always the prankster in the lion's den. And um, it was always funny as long as it wasn't directed at you. <laughs> uh, it was always funny that way. It came a little less funny when you were the subject of his practical jokes. Dr. Smith X is asking, what was your most challenging victory? Hmm. Well, that's a good one. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I had a boxing fight one time, and it's not MMA, but I had a boxing fight. Actually, it was my second to last boxing fight, and uh, I fought a guy who was uh, uh, he was ranked uh, 28th in the world, and and uh, he was good. He was uh, he was beating the shit out of me, and um, he was great defense and stuff like this. And I literally looked like the pumpkin man. Uh, my my head was so swollen from the I, I never took so many shots. And he hit me right at the sec at the end of the second round, and and I got hit. The bell rang, and the stool came in. I sat down. The only problem was I sat down in his corner. <laughs> I was I was rocked, and uh, that fight I ended up winning. I ended up knocking the guy out in the third round. But it's funny because I, I I I don't really remember too much of the fight. That's how that's how that's how banged up I got. And so uh, it was uh, I was like yeah. I might want to put boxing on the hold for a while. <laughs> I'm a brain heal. Do you think the tournament format in UFC could ever return? And do you think that was a fair way of judging who was the best fighter? 
Uh, no, I mean, it's not the best way to judge who's the best fighter. It's like who gets the best draw a lot of times. Um, you know, it, uh, you know, I, I mean, the tournaments, I, 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 I you know, I'm, I'm kind of got, I, I, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. Okay. I think, you know, um, I think it's kind of cool because yeah, competing in the tournaments and I, you know, I fought in the young blood tournament, uh, in, uh, Japan, you know, we had, what do we, what do we have? We have like 16 batch, uh, 16 guys. on. I think we had four, four fights in one day. And, uh, we, um, uh, you know, that was tough. That was tough ones. We had two in the, uh, like, uh, around noon and, uh, uh around uh, one o'clock, two o'clock. And then we had two more around, uh, 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 six, six or seven, something like that. And so it was, that was a, that was a long day. And, um, I'm not really, I, I, it's funny as an athlete, I'm not that much a fan of it, but as a, as a fan, I, I think the tournaments are kind of cool because there's a bit of romance to it that comes with the idea of these guys fighting like that. But I, I like the format now. A lot of guys, they talk about going back to the old days with the no rules, but I, I like the medium in which they have now, to be honest. I, I like the idea of being a sportsman. Uh, you know, I like the idea of that much better than, than um, you know, than the no holds barred. Joe is wondering if you ever got in any fights outside the ring with another MMA fighter. Uh, no, that's a simple one. No, most guys, you know, most guys, I, I, you know, in the MMA world, I'm fairly well liked because I'm a pretty even kill guy. The only, the only scuffles I have now are generally just some drunk idiot. And that doesn't really turn out good for that drunk idiot. That's about it. Weren't you attacked by someone with a knife at one point? And you yeah, just I, got my, I got my thumb almost cut off. Yeah. What, what's the story of that? Oh, that one? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, what happened was, uh, I was picking up a, it was Christmas time. It was like right after church. I dropped my family off at the house and I went to pick up my daughter's, uh, Christmas present. And, um, it was, it was a bike. It was at a sporting goods store. Um, and so as I'm walking in, I noticed there was something going on. There was some, some kind of noise being made, but I didn't pay much attention because I was in a hurry. So I ran into the store. I went and, you know, they had the bike, they assembled the bike for me and everything, and they had brought it up. I went to pay for it, and I realized I didn't have my wallet. So I was like, oh, crap, because I had this bad habit of putting my wallet on my lap, and when I get out of the truck, it, you know, it fall. Literally, I would find my wallet on, you know, on the ground by my truck. So I'm freaking out, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I didn't, I hope I didn't do that. So I ran back to the truck, and when I ran back to the truck, I I'd actually left my wallet there. But then I looked over, and I saw, all of a sudden, I heard, like, uh, like three loud F-bombs go, like loud F-bombs. I look up and I see this woman go flying back against this car and falls down. This guy's kind of looming over and there's these people standing over there, but they're not doing anything. So I'm like, oh gosh, uh, I ran over there and, uh, you know, tried to talk the guy off. You know, he was really, he was jacked up on something and uh, tried to talk him down. You know, I was like, you know, hey, it's Christmas. Well, anyways, uh, long story short, uh, it, it, you know, he, he uh, started swinging on me, and he was a punk, and I dropped him on his head. To be honest, what he did, he bit me and pissed me off. So I he hit him with a head and arm throw. And you know, at the time, I was still still uh, active as an athlete fighting, and so I was about probably 215, 220 at the time, which is 20 pounds heavier than I am right now. And this guy was probably a buck 50. So when I threw him, you know, I mean, dude, he, he went flying. And when he hit the ground, um, it uh, I thought I killed him. I mean, literally, he went completely limp. And the problem was that I had this – jackass filming the whole thing not helping anything but filming it and so i'm like oh man like normally i'd have just got up and walked off but now you know i got this guy filming me so i'm also uh uh you know obviously you know as a doctor and stuff paramedic trained as paramedic trained before that emt trained so i'm you know basically bring this guy back around because i'm being filmed <laughs> and uh so he started coming on too and i you know i you know, realized he wasn't dead and was gonna be okay and then i walked over to this girl and i was like listen girl if you want to go with me i said i'll take you i said but or, or you can go on your own or you can go with this guy but you gotta make up your mind right now and she goes please can you take me home i said okay so she got up he was on his feet jumping around at me and i didn't realize he had pulled out the knife at that point I, he threw a, a, a kind of a wide angle punch at me and um i blocked it and hit him and knocked it and I smashed his face actually he impaled himself on my face he hit so hard his, it shattered his, to be honest, it shattered his face. I mean, it broke his cheekbone, his orbital socket, and uh, and his nose. With one shot, basically threw himself on my fist. But I literally hit him, so I thought I broke my hand. The noise was so loud, I said, 
I, I must have broke my hand. It didn't hurt yet, but I, oh, I broke my hand. And he went down. And when he went down, the knife fell out of his hand. And I was like, oh, man, I could have been cut. And I looked down at my left hand where I blocked the shot. And I didn't even feel it, but he sliced right through my thumb. And um, so I had to have surgery on that. But I had one surgery repairing my, my hand. He had four surgeries trying to fix his face and his arm because I broke his arm pretty bad. So I'm not sure if that makes me the winner or not. But uh, Well, I'm glad you survived it because whenever you're dealing with a knife, like it's always dangerous. Oh, right, yeah. I mean, you're going to get cut. I mean, I'm actually, I am actually actually train in our niece, which is a form of uh, – Filipino stick and knife fighting. I mean, I haven't trained in a long time, but I, I'm black belt in that. And I was like, the one thing you reside the fact when you do that, if you're going to play with knives, you're going to get cut. I just didn't, to be honest, I didn't see it. It could have been a lot worse, which I'm, I'm grateful. I think God was looking out for me. There's a fan on here that says he once saw you on a dating show. How did that happen? <laughs> I actually, I was never on a dating show. What, what he's probably referring to is one of the more embarrassing things that I had. I, I, I got talked into doing. Um, Fox did a show called America's Most uh, America's Most Eligible Bachelor, and it, they only did one show, and it was basically like a beauty contest for men. You know what I mean? It was really cheesy. But a girlfriend of mine was like, she's like, you should do this. You could win it. You know, they, they wouldn't have you know. And I'm going to have someone as unique as you out there, you know, doing this. And anyway, so I, you know, she actually did all the stuff. She sent in all the stuff and, and, and I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think, you know, they would pick me, but they ended up picking me for the contest. And then, so I won. And then, so I went to the contest and they, uh, I ended up being, um, 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 I ended up winning the Texas uh, for lack of better terms. I was like, Mr. Texas. And then we went to this big contest that they showed <laughs> on, uh, on Fox and uh, I didn't win it, but, um, but I had a feeling that I wouldn't because I think they were a little nervous about the guy who fought professionally for a living being, you know, kind of their spokesman for this show. But, but it, it was fun. It was interesting because I actually made friends with two of the guys on the show that I'm still friends with today. And this was like, hell man, this was 20 years ago, maybe. So kind of cool. And I understand you were involved on the promotion side of the dream events on HD.net, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I was the president of uh, H, uh, of HDNet Fights, which was the, con well, it turned out to be the whole entire sporting program for HDNet eventually. But, um, but at the time, we were just focusing on uh, developing, uh, you know, combat sports, mostly MMA, but we were doing kickboxing, a little bit of pro wrestling, stuff like that. Um, because uh, HNet was, uh, you know, geared a little bit more towards an older crowd. Because at the time, most people that had high def TVs were a little bit older, so you know they were trying to come up with an uh, angle. So um, I just happened to be at the right time, right time, at the right place. And Mark Cuban um, um, called me up. Uh, I did a deal with them on something else, and flew me out to Vegas for what was supposed to be a one-hour meeting to discuss the possibility of doing this. It turned out to be a five and a half hour meeting, which is interesting because he's got a lot of energy card going. We were just, just kicking ass, boom, boom. And he goes, Hey, you got to stay the night now. And, and so we ended up celebrating. I became the president of that. He hired another guy named Andrew Simon, who was a CEO. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we all went out that night. And by the way, just so you know, being a billionaire in Vegas is a lot more fun than the rest of us, just so you know. So was, uh, I got to play billionaire one night in Vegas with Mark Cuban. How long did that relationship last working for him? Um, yeah, it was it was a great relationship. I mean, you know, to be honest, uh, he, he did a lot for me. He did a lot for me. Um, one, you know, he, he had confidence in me. You know, when I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself, I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And um, he, um, you know, encouraged me to go off and do stuff. And and, and I even like, you know, as much as um, as much as uh, I enjoy working for him and stuff, it's not my passion, right? What, TV wasn't my passion, so. You know, I, I talked to him about it and he encouraged me to go on to do, do other things with his blessing. And it turned out to be a good thing. I understand you were also on Walker, Texas Ranger a bunch of times and involved in some projects with Chuck Norris. How did you become friends and business partners with him? Um, well, uh, well, actually, we met years and years and years ago at a karate tournament when I was a kid. He was... Uh, he was, uh, he, he actually was really cool because he stopped 
walked by, you know, Chuck Norris walked by, he went, oh my God, Chuck Norris. And he literally stopped, walked by, you understand, man, I was an awkward kid, man, you know, and uh, he stopped and goes, hey, what's your name? And I said, oh, it's Guy Miller. He goes, I saw you fight. He goes, that was amazing. I was like, oh my gosh, I could have walked on water at that point. Chuck Norris just said I was amazing, you know, and I think I was probably about 14 years old at the time. And uh, it was like awesome, you know, having that compliment from him. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, he actually follows a lot of, 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 of uh, combat sports. And um, so he calls me up for his TV show and he goes, Hey, would you be this? Cause you know, we want to get guys in there. Like, you know, cause at the time I was like the number, you know, I was a kickboxer and I was trying to come up and up and coming in there. And so he was like, yeah, I said, would you be interested in doing the t- you know, the TV show? So I did. And, uh, you know, basically I played a bad, I always played a bad guy, got beat up by Chuck, but, um, but you know, then, uh, you know, and then flash forward years later, I'm retired. Uh, um, I'm, uh, I hadn't quite started working for Mark Cuban yet, but, um, what happened was they called me up about Chuck wanting to do this, uh, uh, world combat league. And they, they basically hired me to, I was the league director. And so we did that until, um, you know, until it's time for me to kind of leave, they, they were kind of going a different direction than I thought we should go. And I just didn't see it working out that way. And, and um, so I decided that it was probably a good idea for me to leave. And that's when um, I got the offer from Mark Cuban. And so it kind of worked out serendipitously. But Chuck's a great guy. He's always been very good to me. You know, even now, you know, he, you know, he, I'll, I'll talk to him every now and then he's, he's doing well. And, and like I said, it was, uh, you know, it was kind of cool to, cool to be, pointed out too that, that I looked great by Chuck Norris. And it was also kind of really cool that I got to work for Chuck Norris and work with him hand in hand in developing. So it was kind of a cool deal. Did you ever get the opportunity to train or spar with him? Not really. I mean, we did a little bit of goofing off there. Um, um, during, we, we, we trained just a, a little bit of jujitsu and stuff. People don't realize he's also a black belt in Brazilian jujitsu. So, uh, you know, he, he's, he's one of those guys that did some wrestling as well as being a movie star and cry champion. He actually is a full, really true martial artist. I mean, he trains in, you know, he was a badass karate guy. He did a little bit of boxing training, you know, he knew the value of that. And um, obviously some kickboxing training. But um, then he, you know, he's a big fan of the Machados and, and was uh, got a black belt under under the Machados, which I, I find uh, extremely cool because he could easily rest on his lulls of being a movie star. I think he was six-time world karate champion, but no, he goes out there and, and, and gets in there and gets dirty and gets gets his black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It's cool. I understand you came up with the whole bully beatdown show. Was that under yeah. Mark Cuban? No, that was a that was a separate deal. Um, what what it, it was interesting how that came about. Um, what happened was uh, I was a, a technical advisor on on a TV show, and uh, there was this camera guy who apparently did not like me. And uh, so he uh, he expressed his dislike to me. <laughs> it didn't turn out real good for him. And uh, the producers of the show were, they were like freaking out. They're like, dude, this happened to you all the time? I was like, no, it actually doesn't ever happen to me. I'm not sure what this guy's problem is. And uh, anyway, so they were like, we could do a show around this. And so we, I, so I, I was like, yeah, we could. Because I was talking about some of the things I, that happened to me when I was a younger guy. And uh, so we, that's how we, we originally did it. It was a little bit different when we started. Originally, it was called American Badass. And it was a little different. It was, just, it was kind of more on the fact that we had guys who thought they could fight pro fighters. And, uh, and then so when we, we – so when, when – um, uh, uh, the guy who does Survivor, what's his name? The, the, produce, the guy who produces Survivor, I can't think of his name right now. So I'm falling blank. Maybe I got hit too many times. Um, he, when he came on as the executive producer – uh, he changed it to the more more of the format of like the bully beatdown format, which which I, I liked our original one better. But you know, he is the executive producer; he knows how to make the show. So, there's a, been a few fans on here that want to know why you never went into pro wrestling. <laughs> well, you got to know how to pro wrestle first. I mean, it's it's an art form in its own, and I never really spent time doing that. And to be honest, I mean, pro wrestling is uh, pro wrestling is really not fake. People call it fake. It's not. It's real. Now it's scripted, and the results are probably you know already there. But it's real. Those are real slaps. Those are real punches. Those are real kicks. That's a real chair hitting you. That's a real twelve foot drop on top of a you know 
on top of a ladder and stuff. And so, um, you know, I just didn't want to put my body through it. And, you know, and, and especially at the time, what they were kind of offering wasn't really where I wanted to go. You know, so I, I just never really pursued it. Would that have been a Japan offer or a WWE offer? Uh, it was in Japan. It's Japan. There's a fan on here asking how much road work you put in during your fighting days. Running? If I run, yes. I, I prefer just I preferred sparring to running. Um, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would have probably done a little bit more running, more sprinting. But you know, is that saying hindsight's a bitch? Rec is asking, what's your opinion on Conor McGregor talking about fighting Manny Pacquiao in boxing? I don't think the first fight was real to start with this anyways. I think it was a sparring match between two guys that made hundreds of millions of dollars. So I don't know what to expect out of this one. It's probably the same thing. Is there any of today's fighters that if you were still in your 20s or 30s that you would have liked to have fought? You know, I, I, I never, like, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't waste a huge amount of time on, on that kind of speculation for me. You know, I mean, I'm kind of more of a here in the moment kind of guy. Um, I mean, there's a lot of guys. I mean, to be honest, I mean, if I was in my 20s coming up, whoever's in front of me, keeping me from being the champ is who I'm going to fight, you know, and that's who I want to fight. And, you know, that's always the case. And in, in, in my career in the past, the guys I, I wanted to fight, you know, I want to have rematches with everybody I lost. There's not, any, there's not anybody I fought that I don't think I could have beaten. That you know, the guys that beat me, there's, I, I, I there's never been a doubt in my mind that that I, I could, uh, you know, change that circumstance if, if, if I had another fight with them. So, um, so if that answers the question for you. Now, I'm sure this may have varied from fight to fight, but Bob is wondering what your typical uh, routine would have been in a training camp for a fight as far as what you would eat and how often a day you would train? Yeah. I mean, it's basically the same thing. I usually trained, uh, you know, uh, uh, I usually did, uh, uh, five days a week. I would train twice a day and then two, two of those five days, I would train three days, three times a day. So I'd, two days would be three day workout, uh, three times a day and two of those, th and then three of them would be twice a day. And, um, you know, eating, I've always been, um, you know, I've always been, um, a, uh, pretty, you know, well knowledgeable about, like I said, I'm a nutritionist. I mean, I got my master's in it. So, uh, you know, I was always up on, on, um, food and stuff like that. And the thing back then was I was, I had to put on more weight because there was really no weight classes and stuff. And, and I would walk around more like I do now at 200. So it was a staggering amount of food I had to eat, <laughs> you know, so and what are you doing with yourself now? I know you have a martial arts academy, but there's a lot of fans on here asking what you've been doing uh, post-retirement. Well, I was a television executive for a while, and then um, I started a, a, a practice um, called Optimal Health Specialist with a, a doctor's group. I joined the doctor's group, and um, I left them uh, about two years ago to start my own. And we're launching um, a new practice. I got a new, new medical director and a new crew. It's called Mesger Systems. And it is a uh, proactive healthcare deal. The problem is with today's medicine, the problem with medicine today in America is that we go when we're injured or hurt, you know, way, way, too, way too late. In, in the East, in the Eastern philosophy of medicine is you go to the doctor to stay healthy. And so our practice is about coming to us and, and getting some really good diagnostics done and then put together a plan to keep you healthy so you don't get cancer so you don't age prematurely so you know you, you know you don't have heart disease and things like that and so we should be launching the new the new platform um uh in january and so i mean i i, I still um you know i still do uh, uh martial arts of course i'll do that till the day i die i have a great gym and great people and um you know and it's a, a, a intricate part of my life and that, that won't ever change. And it's just that, to be honest, uh, I, uh, it's weird. I don't like hurting my fellow human being. I'm kind of really good at it, which is kind of weird, but I don't really necessarily like hurting people. And I, I, I enjoy being a doctor. I enjoy the fact that I, I get to help people and, and um, you know, make people healthy and strong. Is there any social media where people could contact you or follow you? 
Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I got my Facebook guys. Anybody, you know, a big fan of Facebook? I'll be honest, I get uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, friend numbers. But if you want to, like, message me and say, hey, listen, I'd love for you to be my friend, uh, you know, then, then I do because I don't even really look at it. But if I get a message like that, of course, I, I want to be, um, you know, I want people to want to have conversations with and start this. It's, I mean, Facebook is kind of a crazy thing because I've been able to maintain relationships and friendships with people that, I haven't seen in 10, 15 years, like a lot of guys in Japan and things like that, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can get me on um, uh, uh, Facebook and, um, and um, like I said, I'm a guy, Mesger, and then we'll have uh, Mesger systems up uh, in January. There's a fan on here that's asked a bunch of times if there was any hazing in relation to the lion's den, if you actually lived there in the house. I don't know, I never lived in the house. I mean, I mean, you know, it was always, I mean, it would suck to be one of the young boys because you had to do all the chores and you had to do all the other stuff like that. It was a lot like Japan, you know, all the young boys in Japan, they, they basically had to bust their ass. They had to shave their heads. They had to bust their ass, take care of all the, all the and all that kind of stuff and clean and cook and do all that kind of stuff. And the young boys had to do all that. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that would consider hazing as it was just kind of what your responsibilities were. But, you know, I didn't really say, I mean, like I said, I didn't really spend... Uh, I didn't stay at the fighter's house. I, you know, I, I was already established in Dallas, uh, you know. So. Did you have a favorite combination? Yeah, jab, cross, left leg to the head. I knocked out probably a good 30 people with that combo. And as far as advice for uh, up-and-coming MMA fighters that could very well be watching this, what would you tell them? Now, it's a loaded question. It's a loaded question. First of all, I would tell you, don't do it. <laughs> it's rough business, man. I mean, you got to do martial. I mean, you got to be in this. Here's my advice. Do it because you love it, not because you're worried about making money. Okay? That's the way I look at it. You know, if you make money at it, great. If you don't, great. Because your passion is the martial arts. Your passion is the competing. And, uh, you know, and then, then you'll never be disappointed. But uh, it's a tough business. I would tell you, you know, if you're going to get on the business side of stuff, get yourself a good manager. You know, get a good coach, get a good, good, good group of uh, training partners because they're going to be invaluable to you. And then get somebody who understands uh, the ins and outs of the fights, the fights that you need. And that's going to be important. That's super important. It is super, super important. And, uh, and then always have a backup plan because you can be one injury away from being done in the fight business. And you gotta got to be able to do something else. And last question here. There's been a bunch of fans wondering. I know you, I believe you have a daughter and a son. Any chance of seeing either of them in the fight game? Yeah, I got two sons. And, uh, I hope. Um, it's a shitty business. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I love competing. If, if, if the fight business was only about competing, then I'd probably still be competing today, you know? Uh, but it's not. There's a lot of stuff in it that's not. Uh, a huge amount of fun, and in uh, the business side of it isn't. I mean, they wear you out. I mean, they really do. And um, you know, uh, so I, I don't necessarily want that for my kids. If my son, my, my daughter, she's uh, she actually has the uh, personality of a fighter, but she uh, she's probably going to be a social justice warrior. She's going to be that lawyer who sues the shit out of people for you know civil rights issues. She's one of those she, like that. She's she, like my son. Uh, or well, I have a 30 year old son. He, he was never much into the, I mean, he was, he was a good athlete and at martial arts, but again, a sweet kid didn't have the, the same, kind of this, you know, same kind of personality I had. So, you know, he just really wasn't interested. And my son, Logan, he's a little bit more like me, you know, um, but he, um, a really good athlete. He's an excellent wrestler, excellent boxer and kickboxer. Um, and uh, I just, you know, it's like I said, it's just a tough business. If he wants to do it, I, I'll, of course, I'll support him. But, you know, it's just a tough business to do stuff. And, and uh, you, you don't necessarily want that for your kids. You know, I don't put them through these uh, expensive private schools and encourage them to get these scholarships because, I, you know, I'd, I'd rather see him be a doctor or something like that. You know? I mean, maybe you do both. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, so. And he also has a lot to live up to when you have a father that's a former – UFC champion, that can be a lot of pressure on a kid. Yeah, and, you know, the one thing that, that that you always want your kids, you want your kids to have their own identity. 
You know, it's important to me that my kid doesn't, my, my sons, my sons particularly don't live like that. Like, like, like they don't live in my shadow and they don't because they're amazing human beings in their own right. And they do amazing things, you know, that are completely different than what I would do. And, um, you know, so it's always been important to me that, that they, you know, that they set their, you know, they set them the, themselves up outside of my shadow and it's been, you know, and they've done a good job on it, you know? Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with us. I've got uh, tons of respect for all of your accomplishments and I'll let you uh, finish this off with uh, whatever message you want to leave the fans with. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't even really know what to say guys. I, I appreciate all the support that I've had over the years, you know, to be honest. I mean, I couldn't have done this with, if the fans didn't want to see me fight. And so they did. And I appreciate, uh, you know, the, the, you know, support. Um, and it's fun because you know, I've been retired, you know, I really, I, I really didn't have a fight after 2004. Uh, but I officially retired 2005. And um, the, uh, uh, I just think uh, it was nice uh, having all the fans. And even now, you know, you kind of, you know, because of the internet, because of conversations like I'm having right now, you get to enjoy that, uh, that time again. And I appreciate that. It, it's nice to be remembered. And it's nice to be remembered in a positive way. So I appreciate you guys. And I hope that you guys have a blessed day. And I know that a lot of you guys are having a tough time with this COVID-19. I get it. And a lot of jobs, stuff like that. I do understand something, guys. You guys are all stronger than you know. You know, and that you'll get through this and just be focused on, on what you need to do to get through this. And uh, let's just have a better year. Okay. 2021 could be a better year. All right, guys. Y'all have a blessed day.